Happy Sabbath. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Here we are, another week, and ready to study uh, our lesson for the Sabbath school. Exciting as always, never boring. Um, I have here with me Mary and Greg, who are a husband and wife team. And I'm Danielle, looking forward to studying together and uh, spending this hour uh, in the Word. So let's begin. We have been studying this entire quarter so far uh, about rest. Rest. But before we really get into the lesson in depth, and we start studying the title of today, which is Finding Rest in Family Ties, we're going to start with a prayer. Greg, would you open us our lesson? Sure. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath morning. And Lord, we ask and pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us. May everything that we speak be from you through your Holy Spirit. And Lord, may your words fall upon listening ears for those who have joined us online to listen. And help us to take to heart the principles that you want us to understand and to apply in our lives. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So as we're beginning to study about finding rest in family ties, as I was reading this, uh, the title of the lesson, I kind of get excited, but also all of a sudden very confused. <laughs> because finding rest, it means that there isn't rest. So there is, rest is to be found in family ties. And I immediately started kind of thinking through my life, my relationships, my family ties, and thinking of the stresses. And also at the same time, it's almost like it was, on one hand, almost like a tug of war. One, I would think of something negative, and then I would think of something positive of how supportive my family has been through tough times. And then challenges that sometimes really made me very unrested and extremely, de you know, how should I say, the opposite of composed. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when I looki was looking at that, the back and forth, the back and forth challenge versus blessing of ties, I could see how meaningful this subject for today's lesson is of rest uh, for in family times, finding that rest. And when we're looking at our lesson, it's, we're starting with um, the memory text. And the memory text in our lesson is 2 Peter 3, 17, 18. Let's read it together. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness fastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. In the opening, as the memory text, is almost like a warning. Be steadfast, be careful, or else you'll fall away. So it w in connection with the title, it's a warning that family ties and stresses uh, can cause this lack of rest almost to the point where it could maybe undermine our well-being and even our salvation. So it's pointing to the importance of finding this rest in family ties. So it's be, it seems like a very scary quest. It seems like maybe sometimes unreachable when we're thinking of the um, family dynamics that sometimes we've experienced in the past. So the, here comes to the rescue, the story of Joseph in the Bible. And the beginning of the lesson almost starts like a movie scene. It's, in the, it's starting from the, not the beginning of the story of Joseph, but rather in a very intense moment in his life. And we see all of a sudden how he is approaching his brothers who are encamped out in, in far away from home in fields with their sheep. And as he's approaching, they are not happy to see him. He's coming very happy, but they are not happy coming. They're not happy to see him. They're all of a sudden making plans to hurt him. First, to kill him. 
this is his family. They wanted to kill him. And then one of the brothers comes in through the fa family dynamics and he negotiates with his brothers and says, let's just put him in a pit. And then we proceed to see the next steps where they're continuing to negotiate while he is starving, scared, without his beautiful coat, in a pit, not knowing what the future is going to bring. He has heard his, his brother saying they're going to kill him, hurt him, and so on and so forth. And he is thinking, are they going to retract this or not? And then one of his other brothers comes up with the idea to sell him as a slave. And the story begins here, finding rest in family ties. And without much further, we're going to go on to Sunday's lesson. Um, and on Sunday's lesson, Mary is covering Sunday's dysfunction at home, covering some of the background for us. Yes, in order for us to understand better um, how Joseph got to the position where he's at, it's good if we understand what his home was like. And as the title for Sunday says, Dysfunction at Home, um, we're going to see, first of all, according to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, dysfunction means abnormal or unhealthy interpersonal behavior or interaction in a group. So the title tells us Joseph's home was broken, flawed, and less than ideal. Let's review some highlights of his family history. First of all, let's go back to Abraham and Sarah, his great-grandparents. Sarah realizes she's barren, so she gives her maidservant Hagar to Abraham to produce an heir. Hagar has a son, and now there's rivalry between Hagar and Sarah as wives. Then Isaac is born to Sarah, and there's rivalry between him and Ishmael. And Abraham favors one son over the other. Isaac then carries the spirit of favoritism into his own family and favors one son, Esau, over his other son, Jacob. Later, Jacob gets tricked into marrying two sisters who didn't get along and compete with each other through a childbearing race, even enlisting their handmaids to bear Jacob's children. Jacob ultimately has 12 sons with two wives and two concubines. And then we have another tragic story in the family, aside from what we're going to study in detail with Joseph. This story has to do with Dinah, Jacob's daughter, and her brothers. In Genesis 34, we find the story. In verse 1 and 2, we read, Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and violated her. One of Jacob's daughters, here we're reading, is raped by a Canaanite prince named Shechem. He's in love with her and recruits his father to aid him in securing the marriage arrangement with Dinah. Jacob and his sons find out what happened. Jacob holds his peace until his sons come back from the field, and they were very angry. The king appeals on behalf of his son and attempts to convince Jacob to give Dinah to wed his son and thus to make a pact between two ethnic groups to allow them to intermarry. Shechem adds to this, whatever you ask, I'll give for her. Just give me her. Verse 13 states, but the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor his father and spoke deceitfully because he had defiled Dinah their sister. So what was it they said deceitfully? Let's read verse 15. But on this condition we will consent to you, if you will become as we, if every male of you is circumcised. So the king and prince return to town and convince their townsmen to get circumcised. After three days, when all the men are sore and weak, 
Dinah's two full brothers, Simeon and Levi, slaughter every male in the city. They rescue their sister and take the remaining women, children, wealth, and animals. So what sort of emotional and relational impact would this incident have had on the family as a whole? They must have felt violated, disrespected, dishonored, abused, resulting in anger and rage and a desire to execute justice and seek revenge. In Patriarchs and Prophets, we're told that the two sons hid their intentions from their father and that they committed a grievous sin and that Jacob felt there was cause for deep humiliation. Cruelty and falsehood were manifest in the character of his sons. So how do you think this impacted Joseph? We're studying about him this week. In the book Spiritual Gifts, we read this about him. Joseph listened to his father's instructions and feared the Lord. He was more obedient to his father's righteous teachings than any of his brothers. He treasured his instructions and with integrity of heart loved to obey God. He was grieved at the wrong conduct of some of his brethren and meekly entreated them to pursue a righteous course and leave off their wicked acts. His hatred of sin was such that he could not endure to see his brethren sinning against God. It seems this tragedy had a very different emotional impact on him. There are other incidents too. Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, displayed dominance and defiance to his aging father by sleeping with one of his father's concubines. Judah mistook his widowed daughter-in-law for a prostitute and had twins with her. And ultimately, the favoritism that Jacob showed toward Joseph by giving him an expensive, colorful coat, which leads to the evil plan carried out by his brothers. All these are incidents of what happened in this one family. If there was a family with abnormal or unhealthy interpersonal behaviors, the patriarch's family could have competed with it. So given all the issues and dysfunctionality with this family, why do you think Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are listed as faith heroes in Hebrews 11, 17 to 22? And it reads, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. Isn't it amazing how all these men with such um, dysfunction in their lives were mentioned in the chapter of the heroes of faith? Could it be because they believed in God's love, forgiveness, guidance, and protection, despite their dysfunctional characters, actions, lives, and families? Let this family's example remind us of God's faithfulness toward us despite our messy family relationships. They learned, often the hard way, about faith, love, and trust in God as they wrestled with these family issues. And as, as we continue to Mondays, we'll study more about this one incident in the family. Choosing a new direction. Greg. Okay. Well, Monday's lesson is titled Choosing a New Direction. And I want to begin again by reading 2 Peter 3, 17 through 18, just as a reminder. Mm. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. 
Amen. So God is not only speaking to the Israelites, he's speaking to us, to each one of us today. And what he's saying is, I know you and you know me. So beware, be very careful that you don't get seduced by the wicked and the wickedness of the world, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as we pick up today's lesson, Monday's lesson, it draws from Genesis 37 and through and 39, but we don't have time in this lesson and segment to go through all of that. But at this point, Joseph is being sold to the Ishmaelites, the Midianite traders, for about 20 shekels of silver. And he was on his way to Egypt to be sold as a slave. And I just want to make a quick point here as we go forward reading. I know we've mentioned this before, but always begin your study with prayer then scripture. And then for more perspective, you can look at the writings of Ellen G. White. Remember, she's the lesser light pointing to the greater light. The Bible provides God's principles, then she simply provides perspective on his principles. So we, we have to make sure to keep that in mind. The reason why I'm saying that is because I want to read something that she wrote in Patriarchs and Prophets, and it basically summarizes Genesis 37 and 39. And she states, and I quote, as he saw the merchants, the dreadful truth flashed upon him. To become a slave was a fate more to be feared than death. So imagine his emotional mindset while all this was taking place. He was so distraught that for a while he gave himself up to uncontrolled grief and terror. Why? Because in his father's home, he was a tenderly cherished child, and probably very annoying to his brothers. Mm -hmm. And now he was hated by his brothers, and not only abandoned, but sold into life of slavery in Egypt. So how would we have reacted if we had been in his situation, in his situation at his age? Think about that. Now she continues, Ellen White continues in Patriarchs and Prophets. He saw his angry brothers and felt their fierce glances bent upon him. The stinging, insulting words that had met his agonized entreaties were rising in his ears. With a trembling heart, he looked forward to the future with a change in situation from a tenderly cherished son to a despised and helpless slave. Alone and friendless, what would be his lot in the strange land to which he was going? For a time, Joseph gave himself up to uncontrolled grief and terror. But, and we're going to show this on the screen, but in the providence of God, even this experience was a blessing to him. He had learned in a few hours that which years might not have otherwise have taught him. Then his thoughts turned to his father's God. He had learned of the love of God in providing for men a redeemer. Now all these precious lessons became vividly before him. Joseph believed that the God of his fathers would be his God. He then and there gave himself fully to the Lord and he prayed that the keeper of Israel would be be with him in the land of his exile. So Joseph could have succumbed to the Egyptian way of life, but he made a decision. He made a choice. He made a personal choice. He chose God. And at some point in our lives, that's a choice we all have to make, either for God or against him. And as we know, it started off relatively good in Egypt. He found favor with Potiphar, but then it went terribly wrong because Joseph was falsely accused and thrust into prison because of his virtue. He didn't turn away from God. He didn't lose faith in God. And as we know, God blessed him immensely. And Joseph was able to bless many, many others as well. The point being is that Joseph was facing uncertainty, fear, disappointment, and anger. But he made a choice for God to lead him in his life. That's what we're all facing today in our lives. Who are we going to choose? Who are we going to put our trust and our faith in? So let's read a few passages to encourage us. 
So let's open our Bibles to Deuteronomy 4.29. And that reads, But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. And 1 Chronicles 16.11, Seek the Lord in his strength, seek his face forevermore. And Proverbs 8.10, Receive my instruction and not silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. Isaiah 55, verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. That sounds a little prophetic, doesn't it? We know at some point in time, judgment is going to come. And the ability to call on God will not be available. So seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. So those are really important verses. And as Joshua 24, 15 says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. How about you? And I ask you, is your life going in the right direction? If not, then choose a new direction and ask God to take control. Ask him to take and lead your life. And it's our choice then to follow him. So turning that back now to Danielle. So we're moving right along yes. and uh, already you can see what an amazing lesson this is in Joseph's life. It's one of those stories that the more you read, the more things you uncover, the more you think about it, the more vivid it becomes and more magnificent. Um, Mike assigned the cover uh, for Tuesday is finding true self-worth. Finding true self-worth, our families and our close relationships are pivotal in development of uh, our self-worth as we grow up as children. We are told pretty much who we are through the interactions we have with our families. They, they mold us. And that's how it was as we covered a little bit as you were covering uh, uh, in Joseph's life, the same as it is for each one of us. And he had an image of himself. And his image was that of um, the oldest of the most beloved wife. So in other words, the first born from the, the wife that was favored. So he had a status on that. When reading in Genesis 29, 18, it says, Now Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Rachel happened to be the beloved wife and Joseph's mother. And then another image that he had of himself was that he was treated differently as we have spoken and covered so far in the lesson, Genesis 37, 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. So he loved him and he made it known. There was, as soon as Joseph would step outside of his tent, the entire area would know who he is and that he is special because no one had such a coat. Um, it was visible. And we also know that he put, that put him in charge, even though he was not necessarily um, by assignment the oldest, but he was in charge of his brothers in many ways. He was treated as if he was in charge. I could see if I was one of those brothers, I wouldn't be very happy. <laughs> so I'd, I'd, in this story, I wouldn't be in the good part. I'd be in the other part, <laughs> probably. <laughs> Um, and then disaster strikes. Mm -hmm. And who does he become? A slave, a nobody, from treated like royalty within his family and having the, you know, being from the Abraham seed and um, the beloved wife and all of that, all of a sudden he becomes a worthless a slave with absolutely no rights and no say in any aspect of his life, from life to death or any decisions in his life. And we can see there's a question in our lesson here that really is mind-boggling. In the bottom of our lesson on Tuesday, it says, there are many groups and individuals telling us to love ourselves as we are and ac accept ourselves uncritically. Why is this really self-deception? Why is it important that our worth come from outside of ourselves from the one who made us and knows our true potential? So we are kind of warned in the lesson through this question, and it's a question worth pondering. Um, 
as we develop the self-worth, we are told from outside in some ways who we are. It's not really us that come up with the idea. I mean, we have some input in it, but overall it's from outside. But the source has to be one with a capital O, which is the eternal God. Um, and why? Because our true value gauge is broken. We are in, born in a sinful world, live in a sinful world. We sin along the way. We are told that we have all sinned. So our gauge is broken. Uh, we cannot gauge accurately the only true. And because we, are, we have sinned, we are destined to die. We are worthless. We are worse than a slave. We are already doomed. Um, but our real value source is Christ himself. Through his sacrifice, he puts that value on us. And mm -hmm. um, there are some texts that really outline that so beautifully that it's worth spending a little time reviewing. Isaiah 43, 1 through 4. But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. You were destined to die. You were worthless. I have bought you back. I have redeemed you. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor the flame nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave, gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Since you were precious in my, in my sight, you have been honored. I have loved you, therefore I will give men for you and people for your life. I almost, as I was reading this text, I was thinking of Joseph. And he's worthless, but he is, like through this text, if I were reading, if I am going through something similar that he, like he is, if you are going through some tough times in your life, we are given this assurance that when we pass through the waters, he will be with us. Amen. That when I'll pass through the rivers, they shall not overflow me. And when I'll walk through fire, I shall not be burnt, nor the flames scorch me. And why? Because the Lord is my God. Oh, it's just absolutely beautiful. That's what's interesting in Joseph's trials that, uh, you know, what happened through his trials, the most important factor in Joseph's trials were his fidelity to God, was his recognition that the circumstances of his life did not determine his relationship to God. It seems that he clearly made that decision early on as he was going through, and that was pivotal. And there is a... Um, text in that Ellen White wrote in her writings in the Ministry of Healing, page 471, which I'm going to read because it just says it very beautifully and clearly. Trials and obstacles are the Lord's chosen methods of discipline and his appointed conditions of success. He who reads the hearts of men knows their character better than they themselves know them. And before I continue, actually, I wanted to make a little parenthesis. Um, if we look at a lot of characters in the Bible, they seem to have taken, been taken through uh, trials and journeys and deserts, like the uh, Israelites, they were taken for the 40 days in the wilderness through the trials, the refinement. The Lord was giving them value and was preparing them and refining them. And then David, when he was appointed as a king, he had to go through a long valley of time mm -hmm. uh, and of trials. Um, even Jesus went in the wilderness right after he was uh, uh, baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so in our lives, we all have trials and the Lord does take us, allow us to go through these valleys as a refinement. So continuing, he who reads the hearts of men knows their char character better than they themselves know them. The fact that we are called upon to endure trials shows that the Lord Jesus sees in us something precious which he desires to develop. If he saw in us nothing whereby he might glorify his name, he would not spend time in refining us. He does not cast worthless stones into a furnace. It is valuable or that he refines. 
the blacksmith puts the iron and steel into the fire that he may know what manner of metal they are. The Lord also allows his chosen ones to be placed in the furnace of affliction to prove what temper they are of and whether they are, whether they can be fashioned for his work. And that's what's happened with Joseph. I uh, ran out of time on my day, so I will uh, we'll move right along and continue with doing relationships God's way. Yes, we can either do relationships our way, which I think many of us know how that turns out, yeah. or we can do relationship God's way. So in today's lesson, we're going to study what happened to Joseph in his first few years in Egypt. Greg talked a little about... Um, what happened, but we're going to go into it a little deeper. At this point in his life, he's entrusted himself to God. God blesses him, and he's sold as a slave to Potiphar, the captain of the guard of Pharaoh in Egypt. Let's read Genesis 39, 1 to 6. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Let's look at this a little closely. In what practical ways could God's blessings be seen in Joseph's life? Well, we just read in verse 2 that God's blessing was he made him a successful man. In verse 3, the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hands. And his master noted this. In verse 4, Joseph found favor in his master's sight, and he was placed as overseer of the house eventually. He was given authority to everything in the house. It was all under his management. And in verse 5, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house, and the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had. So the Lord blessed not only Joseph, but the Egyptian's house, his household, the people in it, the fields, everything. So what are the interpersonal relationships like here that Joseph has with everyone at the home? Well, he's overseer of Potiphar's entire house and land, right? So he's working with a number of individuals. Everything, as we read, was placed under his authority. He's interacting well with the household staff, the field workers, Potiphar himself. However, trouble is brewing. His relationship with someone in Potiphar's household is about to get tested. Some of you may be familiar with this story in Genesis 39. We're going to read verses 7 and 9. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So what relational, excuse me, relationship problem is Joseph facing? His employer's wife is enticing him to lie with her. Here's this handsome man, 
with excellent management skills, finding favor with everyone, and Potiphar's wife wants him. How does he choose to manage this situation? He decides to stay loyal to God. Remember, he's planning relationships to do it God's way. So he decides to stay loyal to God, and consequentially, he's going to end up staying loyal to her husband. We read in verse 8, it says, He refused her invitation and reminded her, My master, in other words, your husband, does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. In other words, Potiphar trusted Joseph's capabilities and integrity to the point where he didn't micromanage him, and he trusted him implicitly. He was secure in Joseph's management skills. He continues in verse 9, stating, Nor has he kept back anything from me but you because you are his wife. He reiterates his loyalty to Potiphar, and then he ends with reference to the ultimate authority in his life. And these words are classic. He says, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? I would hope that myself, all of us, would keep this response of Joseph in mind when we're dealing in relationships that maybe are difficult, dysfunctional, and we're trying to make our way through. Despite this woman's multiple unwanted advances, for this was not the only time she tempted him, in verse 10 it says, so it was as she spoke to Joseph day by day, she was doing this every day, tempting him, he did not give in. He chose to apply biblical principles to all his relationships. When faced with difficult relationships with family, friends, co-workers, strangers, do we choose to apply biblical principles to all our relationships? Joseph couldn't control the choices of others. He couldn't control her choice. But he could control his choice. And he decided to live, love, and treat those around him in a way that would honor God. He had learned to live in God's presence. This knowledge helped him resist temptation. The most important factor in Joseph's fidelity to God was his recognition that the circumstances of his life did not determine his relationship to God. I think he made reference to that earlier too. God cared for him, loved him, and strengthened him in every circumstance of life. So in closing, may we all choose to live our life in such a way that honors God no matter the consequences. Let's remember too, Philippians 2.13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Let's trust God and always choose to honor him in each and every one of our relationships. Now I'm going to hand it over to Greg. I think we're going to find out what happened with his choice. Yes, we are. And thank you for a perfect lead up because you stopped at verse 10 and I'm going to pick up at uh, Genesis 39 verse 11, verse uh, 11 through 20 that is. So Thursday's lesson is titled The Great Controversy Up Close and Personal. So I think that means not only is the great controversy going on between God and Satan, but we're caught up in the midst of it. And we go through our own great controversies as well. So let's pick it up here in the life of Joseph when he gets wrongfully accused. So he had been resisting, resisting, resisting. Let's read what happens next. And again, we pick up in verse 11. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was inside. That she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. And so it was when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside, that she called to the men of her house and spoke to them, saying, See, he has brought into us a Hebrew to mock us. He came to lie with me. I cried out with a loud voice, and it happened when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, that he left his garment with me and fled and went outside. So, 
she kept his garment with her until her husband, her master, came home. Then she spoke to him with words like these, saying, The Hebrew servant who you brought to us came into me to mock me. So it happened as I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled outside. So it was when his master heard these words, which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner, that his anger was aroused. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in the prison. So Joseph became the victim of temptation, but also false accusation. The accusation itself could have left Joseph killed right on the spot. But Potiphar didn't quite believe his wife. Joseph found favor with Potiphar. And something tells me that this probably wasn't the first time that something like this happened in that household. But the Bible doesn't say that. But I just uh, speculate on that. However, to uphold his reputation, Potiphar had Joseph thrown in prison. Joseph made a virtuous decision, and for that, he was thrown into prison. So now, Joseph could have well dwelled on the unjust and unfair situation that he was innocently accused of and punished for, but is that what he did? Let's read what happens next in the next few verses. And again, this is Genesis 39, verses 21 through 23. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. So what else happened here? Joseph interacted with the other prisoners and with the prison guard. They began to trust him. Why? Because the Lord was with him. Why was the Lord with Joseph? Because Joseph chose God to do his will in accordance with the law and the will of God. Why? Because Joseph trusted and loved God. So in Genesis chapters 40 and 41, this tells us that while Joseph was in prison, he interpreted the dreams of Pharaoh's imprisoned cupbearer and the baker, and later that of Pharaoh himself. Did Joseph take credit for those interpretations? No, he didn't. Joseph gives credit, honor, and glory to God. And as we read in Genesis 40, verse 8, it says, And they said to him, We each have had a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. So Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell them to me, please. And then in Genesis 41, verse 16, So Joseph answered Pharaoh with Pharaoh's dream and to interpret that. And he says, so Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. So Joseph gives honor and glory to God, not to himself. And God blesses Joseph with the interpretations of the dreams and in all that he does. Think about it. That must really upset Satan quite a bit. The enemy is always trying to tear us away from God with pride, as Joseph could have done. He could have turned towards pride and said, yes, this was my interpretation. He didn't do that. There's another story in the Bible where uh, another prophet does something similar in interpreting dreams, and you'll find that in the book of Daniel. But as mentioned, the enemy is always trying to tear us away from God, whether it's through pride and selfishness, self-righteousness, temptations, adverse circumstances, and also in our personal relationships. Satan is always trying to turn us away from God. And these situations really are likened to like the great controversy. And let me explain why. As Satan tried to turn all the angels in heaven away from God, so too is he trying to get us to to turn away from God. 
Again, whether it's through pride or self-righteousness, worldly temptations, challenging circumstances, and in our own relationship with others, right? So Satan is on the warpath. And in 1 Peter 5.8, we know that he's, he's really on the warpath, like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And as Revelation 12.12 tells us, he knows that his time is short. So Satan is trying to pull, at this time, he's trying to pull Joseph away from God. He's trying to tempt him to commit sin, to reject God. Just as he was trying to pull away from God all the angels in heaven, he was trying to manipulate our relationships with others to hurt God and to devastate us. Just as Satan did with the angels in heaven. You know how much that must have torn at God's heart to know that a third of the angels were cast out of heaven. So what are we supposed to do? Well, what do you think we should do? Let's turn to God's word for guidance and advice. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 13. This is packed with a lot of information, but we'll just go through this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and have done all to stand. So what is Paul telling us here? Paul's telling us here that he wants to give us the power and advice on how to deal with all that the enemy has to throw at us to put on the armor of God, to call upon God. And in Joseph's example, if we are to defend ourselves from the wiles of Satan, from eternal death and destruction, we too need to place our trust and faith in God, in Jesus, by putting on the armor of God daily. We're in the midst of the great controversy, and that's why we need Jesus daily in our lives. Amen. Amen. We are getting close to our, the end of our lesson, and it's time to gather a few thoughts for closing. Well, I would just like to remind everyone that we all come from one big dysfunctional family, and that's the human race. We have sin that we've had to deal with. And so God's word reassures us that despite all of the dysfunctionality, the brokenness, the hurt that we have, he is there for us. And he will, he will make us faithful to him if we just stay connected to him. And if we're willing to do relationships his way. That means always keeping God in mind, that we want to honor him. If we keep him first, automatically we will receive his love, his honor, respect towards us all of our other family relationships and um, relationships with others. Mm -hmm. So let's remember those things um, as we consider what we've studied this week. Thank you. Any thoughts for closing for us? Sure. One thing that comes to mind is throughout the Bible there's a lot of examples of people going through challenging times really, really hard times, mm -hmm. but they choose to put their trust and faith in God. If any of you, if in your lives you feel your life is going in the wrong direction, make a change. Ask the Lord. Ask him, challenge him, God, are you there? Are you real? Will you take control of my life? Mm -hmm. And if you do, I will follow you. Thank you. Actually, I love the words you've both said because I'm wrapping up with something in the lesson that is highlighted for us on Friday. Um, as we were looking at what Joseph went through, he, he really went through some very t horrible times. And despite his clinging to the Lord and listening to the Lord and obeying the Lord, things looked very dismal. Yes. Uh, if I were in his shoes, I would really question the Lord and I would probably think why is this happening to me I have obeyed and here I am I'm doing everything right and following the Lord's uh, 
leading in my life, despite the fact that I'm now a slave, I'm still honoring him and representing him through my behavior uh, and through all the things I do, and I end up in prison, you know, muddied with lies and in a prison cell, and then so on and so forth. We know the, the life story. But he, at those moments, he continued clinging unto the Lord, and that is a clear example for us what to do because there is a, some words that are told to us in um, the writings of uh, Ellen White, uh, which she beautifully portrays these thoughts. He had placed his reputation, talking about Joseph, and interest in the hands of God, and although he was, su he was suffered to be afflicted for a time to prepare him to fulfill an important position, yet God safely guarded that reputation that was blackened by a wicked accuser and afterward in his own good time caused it to shine. We have to remember that when it happens to us. God made even the prison the way to his elevation. Virtue will in time bring its own reward. It may not appear so for a while, but it will. The shield which covered Joseph's heart was the fear of God, which caused him to be faithful and just to his master, master and true to God. He despised that ingratitude which would lead him to abuse his master's confidence, although his master might never learn the fact. And that is the encouragement for us, and you somewhat, we were both alluding to that very thought in some ways. And it's just um, an encouragement to us to remain true to God, faithful, even when it seems like the truth is never going to come out, the Lord will bring it out in due time. Um, so our lesson is for today, as we have covered it, it's, it was a beautiful lesson. And how did Joseph find um, rest in family, uh, in, in the family relationships, really by only looking at the Lord and Amen. not looking at the surrounding circumstances. I'm sure that as he was distraught, his faith was in the Lord. He, and as a result of clinging on to the Lord through every circumstance, the Lord was able to do an amazing work with him and to turn his life into a beautiful jewel he ended up saving a nation, actually surrounding nations, several nations, including his own and his family. The same the Lord can work in our own lives. If we cling on to him, even in the dark times, we, we will only know afterwards, in due time, what the Lord is, what masterpiece the Lord is creating with us Amen. in our lives. Amen. And that's exciting to me. That's something that I'm going to think through many times when I'm going through challenging times so that I'll be encouraged knowing that the Lord has a plan for us. And I'd like to leave you with a thought in Philippians 1, 6. It says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Well, thank you for being with us today for our lesson. We'd like to close with a prayer. Um, will you pray for us, Mary? Yes. Our kind and heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this beautiful Sabbath day, this time that we can invite you into our hearts and minds through your Holy Spirit to open up your word. And we're so grateful for all of the wonderful examples of people and their life histories in the past, Lord, such as Joseph. Thank you for helping us see that even through difficult times with relationships with our families, relationships with others in our lives, we can still find rest and peace as long as our eyes are on you. So I pray that you would please help us to remember that. Help us to remember to honor you always, to stay faithful to you, and even though things may turn apparently negatively for us, even though we're doing what we know to be right, that we just have to wait and be patient for you. And in due time, you will allow your righteousness to show. So we are grateful that you will work through us in that way. Please be with us throughout the rest of the Sabbath day. 
and bless your children around the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you for joining us today. Join our team next week uh, as uh, we have another assigned team for next week leading in this lesson and uh, another lesson coming up. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.